اهدنا الصراط المستقيم Our Lord guide us to the straight path My brothers and sisters to be guided to the straight path means away from all the problems of the world everything that affects our heart everything that affects our mind all the stresses and the problems that we go through family problems work problems financial problems mental problems all sorts of problems come our way and my brothers and sisters when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us guide us to the straight path it means we want an escape from everything that deludes us and takes us away from the path the problem however is that the majority of people can easily be led astray by the following ways Allah says اقترب للناس حسابهم وهم في غفلة معرضون ما يأتيهم من ذكر من ربهم محدث إلا استمعوه وهم يلعبون لاهية قلوبهم وأسر النجوى الذين ظلموا هل هذا إلا بشر مثلكم أفتأتون السحر وأنتم تبصرون الله says in سورة الأنبياء The time of people's reckoning, the day of judgment, has drawn very near. And yet they turn aside in heedlessness. They are unaware. Whenever any fresh verse of the Quran, admonition or reminder comes to them from their Lord, they barely heed it, they barely think about it, and remain immersed in play and games. Their hearts being set on other concerns. Their hearts being set on other concerns. The wrongdoers whisper to one another. This person is no more than a mortal like yourselves. Will you then be enchanted by sorcery while you can see? This verse in Surah Al-Anbiya is very deep. It's talking to every person, not only in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu but towards all of us till the end of time. There is so much distraction in this world. When one of us goes into problems, for example, a lot of us resort to more distractions. In fact, some of us, they resort to sinful behavior in the name of distracting our minds so that we can forget. And so we go into more and more problems and more distress and more mental issues. And on top of that, on top of that, those who want to lead us astray and lead you astray, they whisper among each other. Why would you listen to these people? Or they will whisper to you. They go on the internet, they see your social media, they give you a little message, they DM you, or somebody makes a stupid comment. Look at these people, this Quran. In other words, this is all fairy tales, they say. It's the same word they used to say to each other in those days. What? You follow fairy tales and magic and sorcery while you can see are you are you silly open your eyes and these same statements happen today do not be fooled brothers and sisters these people will continue to bombard you and tell you this is all fairy tales the quran is fairy tales your religion is fairy tales look at you talking about angels and the day of judgment and this hour that's coming which your lord is telling you allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says yes yes all you have to do is read and read the Qur'an without any preconceived notion and let it talk to you. When you recite the Qur'an with an open heart and empty your mind and heart, you will find that the Qur'an is reading you. And when you find the Qur'an reading you, brother and sister, that's when you will see that truly Allah is guiding you. The Qur'an has to read you. If you don't feel it, you're not really with it. And when the Qur'an reads you, you start to see with real eyes. Allah, for example, says, if you doubt that the day of judgment is going to come, if you doubt that 
a Lord exists who is Allah who created this universe, if you doubt that the one who is telling you, I will raise you back to life after death, if you doubt that, if the shaitan plays with your mind, if people play with your mind by calling it fairy tales, then remember this. Remember this. Allah replies when you look at the Quran, Allah says, for example, say, go backwards. If you want to know the truth, go backwards. What is backwards? Remember the time that you were born. Can you see people being born all the time? Yes. Because people, they say, how can I see the hereafter? How can you tell me it exists? I don't see it. So you go backwards. Can you see that you were born? The answer is yes. Okay, now ask yourself the question. Allah says, I gave you an intellect. Were you nothing? Before you were born? The answer is yes. Now, you don't want to get scientifically, you know, technical. I know that in science they'll say, no, you were technically uh, an atom and technically you were some other material. No, no, no. What Allah is telling you is, were you a human being? Were you what you are right now? Because when you die, you turn back into material anyway. But what were you before you were born? Allah says, you were nothing. Nothing to be mentioned. You were not you. How did you become you then? Allah says, for example, in the Quran, Has there not come a time on human beings at one time when they were nothing even to be mentioned? Meaning before you were born. Then Allah says, in another ayah, just as we started you in the beginning, just as we started you in the beginning. In another verse, Allah says, just like that, we repeat the process. Tell me, brothers and sisters, for those who have doubt in the Quran, if you think about it, what's more difficult? For somebody to initiate something originally out of nothing or for somebody to just copy and repeat, rinse and repeat? Which one's harder? To start something from nothing or to repeat something? Start something from nothing is harder. So when you think about yourself, you were nothing. Allah originated you and started you. Repeating it is very easy. أو كالذي مر على قرية وهي خاوية على عروشها in سورة ياسين or like the story of that man when he passed by a deserted uh, village and everybody had died and the buildings were ruined قال من يحيي العظام وهي رميم he later on asked the question who is how how can God bring back life from bones while it was already in ruins and then Allah says قُلْ يُحْيِيهَا الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً Say, the one who created it in the beginning, أَنْشَأَهَا means he started it, he originated it, he initiated it. He can repeat the process again. In another verse, Allah says, Allah made him die for a hundred years and he woke up. He said, how long were you uh, dead for? He said to the angel, a day or part of a day, he says, you were dead for 100 years. Look at your donkey, look at your food, look at yourself. Why am I saying this, brothers and sisters? We need to attach ourselves to the Quran because the Quran is not just fairy tales. It literally talks to you with reasoning. It talks to your reason. You know, the Quran says to reason more than 36 times, to think and ponder more than 40 times. Or collectively, more than a hundred times it says, think, ponder, reason, reflect, ask. The Quran is the best hadith. It is the best conversation. When you detach yourself from the Quran, then you're going to read other people's comments. They're the things that are going to affect you. You go on social media. And I've seen a lot of my young brothers and sisters, this is what, this is what hurts me. We try to... Call them back to reciting the Qur'an, trying to understand it, trying to read different translations of the Qur'an, trying to ask questions about the Qur'an. Just ask a few questions about some of the verses you're reading, like what Shaykh Abu Bakr was explaining about Surah Al-Fatiha. But, unfortunately, we get distracted. 
And then they get affected by little comments that people put on social media. They say, yeah, I'm having doubt. Ya akhi, read the Qur'an. Go back and ask. Wallahi, the Qur'an will wake you up. I used to go through it myself. You know, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to guide you whether you like it or not. And the only one who wants to guide you is somebody who cares about you. And when I say, may Allah guide you, it means I care about you. And you say, may Allah guide you, it means you care about me. Guidance is the best gift that anyone can be given. And I want to tell you about this Lord who told us in the Quran who guides us. Allah says an introductory advice. He says, فَفِرُّوا إِلَى اللَّهِ Flee, run away, turn away and run away very fast to Allah. Surely I am a clear warner to you from him. This is a prophet who said this to his people. He said, run away to Allah. I am a warner from him. If you analyze this verse, it's kind of like an oxymoron. You know the word oxymoron. It's another word for contradiction. He's saying to you, run away. Okay, what do you run away from? We run away from things that, that make us afraid, things that we fear. We run away from all the problems. And then he tells him, run to Allah. Okay. And then he says to them, I am a warner from him. And when you warn someone about something or from someone, again, it's negative. To warn someone from something means you fear that something, yet he is telling you, run away from what you fear to the one that you also fear, who is Allah. It kind of doesn't make sense for the person who takes it on surface level. You know, when someone says to you, fear Allah, some people, they get upset with that word. Fear Allah, brother. Don't tell me to fear Allah. You fear Allah, you beep. And some people say fear Allah because they think they're better than you. So you've got two problems. The people who say fear Allah, they're saying out of arrogance. And the people who get the word fear Allah, they also can't accept it out of arrogance. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Ya akhi, ya ukhti, brother and sister. Doesn't matter what they mean. You take that word and focus on what Allah has told you. Fear Allah, Allahu Akbar. What a beautiful reminder. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu used to say, Rahimallahu mri'in, ahda ilayya uyubi. May Allah have mercy on a person who gifts me my mistakes. He works through the sarcasm and the criticism and takes the benefit. That's a strong person. That's a high value person. It's a powerful person. Anyway, fearing Allah does not mean something negative. It's the most beautiful thing. I don't know if you've heard this story from me before, but I remember when, I, when my little daughter was about two years old. You can also relate to this with your little children, with parents, because sometimes we've got to frown at our children if they do the wrong thing. I remember my little daughter was trying to touch the barbecue. She was going to hurt herself. And obviously I feared for that. So I raised my voice, don't. So she got scared. So she ran to me. La ilaha illa. Do, do, do you have that when your little daughter or son, you say don't, and then they, hug, they, they hold on to you. They're scared of you, but they hold on to you. Has anyone witnessed that before? Don't. And they hold on to you. Am I right or wrong? Hands up if you've witnessed that, if you've experienced that. There you go, all the parents. May Allah bless you and your children. They hold on to you, but they're scared of you. They're holding on to you for security, but they're scared of you because you shouted at them. So my daughter did the same thing. And I said, I'm not happy. You're, you're going to hurt yourself. So she felt that I didn't want her. So she cried. Ah, she's not crying about the fire anymore. She's crying because I couldn't understand. So I'm looking like this. And I held her and put her in my lap. And I said, I'm just scared for you, Baba. And then she slept. She found her comfort. Why? She ran. I'm the one who made her afraid. But she ran from the real fear which will harm her, and that's the fire. The fire has no mercy. She ran to the one who she has experienced mercy and fear from at the same time. 
The only way this verse will work is that if you know who Allah is, He is the one that you love and have the most hope in at the same time you fear. The fear is out of respect and He truly has the right to be feared. Feared means that I am afraid to lose the mercy and the compassion and the love and the connection with my Creator Allah. Because if I lose my connection with my beloved Allah, everything else is evil. I'm going to go downhill. I'm going to the fire. So my fear of Allah is to fear not only his punishment, but fearing losing his love because it's very hard to lose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. And that is why Allah says, so run away from the real evil and go to the one whom you fear out of love. My daughter was afraid of losing the love and the feeling that she once experienced from her father. She didn't want to lose that, so she held on. And when she found that love back, she slept. I mean, as the, uh, in the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, because he was so just and compassionate to the people, the emperor or the commander from Rome came looking for the Khalifa. He said, where is your Amir? Where is your leader? They said, there he is. Actually, they said, we don't know exactly where he is. <laughs> so he went around and found him sleep, sleeping under a tree in simple clothes, by himself, no guards. He said, Adalta. فَأَمِنْتَ فَنِمْتَ You were just. So you found security and so you slept. And with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the same. Through fear of Allah, you find His justice. You find your security and you find your comfort with Him subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah is the just and most merciful. So run away to Allah. Brothers and sisters, if you don't run away, run away to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah will come into the picture and he will give you four stages of reminders. So I'm going to conclude now with how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes into your life and gives you four stages of waking you up. He won't let you go astray because every salat you were reciting, what were you reciting? What did we start with? What we, anyone? Anyone? What is it? Al-Fatiha. Ihdina. As-Sirat al-Mustaqim. Don't you ask Allah this every salah? Oh Allah, guide us to the right path. Since you asked Allah to guide you in the right path every single salah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not let you go astray. But he'll go through four stages. When a person begins to drift away from Allah, or not even that, Sorry, when a person drifts away from Allah and sometimes doesn't even drift away, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to make you even better, He calls you through four stages. In other words, Allah gives you da'wah through four stages. Da'wah means an invite. Allah invites you back through four ways. The first way is the easiest way that is for everybody. Every single one of us in this room and around the world gets this first stage for free. The first stage that Allah goes through is... He shows you and clarifies to you the guidance by exposing you to opportunities to listen or to read or send someone to you to remind you, such as the khutbah on a Friday. Everyone can sit down and listen to the khutbah. That's why we must not talk or engage with anybody during the khutbah on a Jumu'ah. Allah is guiding you. Just listen. Everybody can do that. You go on YouTube and you listen to a topic of your choice about Islam or deen or fear of Allah. Everybody can do that. Who is the one that facilitated this for you? Humans invented it, but who is the one that gave them the intellect and for you the ears to listen? Allah. So Allah brings to you something like that. I've heard young people tell me, you know what, subhanAllah, today I was thinking about this. I opened up my phone and on YouTube, what's the first thing that came up? This. SubhanAllah, wallahi, this is a sign. Yes, it is a sign. It is a sign. Sometimes all week you'll be talking with your friends about something or thinking about something and the khutbah comes. The Jumu'ah, you sit down and you go, oh my Allah, this imam is speaking about the same thing I was thinking about all week. It's a sign. Sometimes you'll be going and you see this religious sister or brother coming your way. You want to run away because then you're going to think it's the haram police or something like that. The shaitan starts telling you all this stuff, right? 
But then they follow you even if you don't like it and you try to be respectful and they remind you about something and they go away. Allah has sent you a messenger. Don't worry about their, whether they were nice or not nice. A strong person is able to sift through that. We cop it all the time. You know what cop means? It's, a, it's an Aussie slang. We cop it means we, we suffer all the time when we're on social media. Lots of people say terrible, terrible, terrible comments to us. All the sheikhs. All the people who are on, on, on social media, we cop all the time. But you have to be able to sift through that ugly comment and remember that you are pleasing who? You are pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I know that I'm doing the right thing and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with me, I will take some of the criticism that guides me and I'll throw out the attitude of the people because I don't want to be like them. May God help them. I'll make dua for them. Say, Allah yahdikum. May Allah forgive you. So Allah sends you free guidance. Now, if that doesn't work for you and you continue to go astray, Allah then goes a little, he, he guides you through a little bit of a tougher approach. The second stage, he will nurture you through disciplining you. So first, you didn't take the reminder when you were comfortable. So then Allah nurtures you by disciplining you. Now I want you to think about discipline in relation to parents. Someone who cares about you. If your mother or father discipline you, or you discipline your children, it is, a, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Of course, with the correct way of disciplining, with care and compassion. You will appreciate that your parents disciplined you in order for you to be principled through care and love. Even sometimes it may be harsh for you, such as confiscating your phone or confiscating your whatever is distracting you. So Allah nurtures you through discipline. How? He will bring a problem into your life. He will bring what? A problem, a challenge into your life. And we all know that humans learn best through what? Through problems. When you learn maths, who, who, who's a mathematician here? Who learns maths? Everybody learns maths. Who likes maths? I hate maths. But if you love maths, mashallah, you're a brain. How do you become a good math mathematician? Isn't it through problems? That's what we call them. We call them problems. We call them problems because once you get through that problem, you're going to feel amazing. You conquered that problem. So Allah gives you a problem. And that's how Allah subhanahu wa dealt with all the prophets and messengers and the companions. So if you have a problem, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guiding you. Take it in a good way. Now, that problem is going to be your medicine. And once you overcome it, inshallah, you're going to be much stronger and better. So Allah gives you a problem, a learning curve, a wake-up call. Somebody might get sick in your family. A death may happen and you attend a funeral. You may see somebody get run over. You may have an accident, God forbid. You may lose something. You may be tested a lot or a little bit, depending on how severe you need that guidance. Then, if that doesn't work, Allah will intensify a little bit more to the third stage. The third stage is, He will bring you something compelling. The problem is up to you how you want to face it. But when He brings you something compelling, it means it's something that you must face. You have no way to avoid it. You have to face it. It could be a court order. It could be a fine. It could be someone that's facing you and you have to deal with that. You can't run away from it. It could be anything like that. It could be a sickness, God forbid. Anything like that is compelling. A suffering and a minor punishment. Allah says, Allah says, and we shall surely let them taste a little bit of punishment or a little bit of hardships in this world. And Allah calls it adna, which means the lower test. Before the bigger test, the bigger punishment comes. Why? Allah says, لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ In the hope that they will return. So why are little punishments happening to you in this world? In the hope that you may what? Return. So you can stand up again. If that doesn't work, not, no reminders, no problems, no compelling situations, over and over and over and they accumulate and we decide to run away from Allah to 
everything else to numb our desires and our fears, drugs, alcohol, crime, uh, God forbid, haram images, uh, haram relationships. I hear of some youngsters, they run away from their parents because into a relationship. This is toxic. Uh, the first guy that talks to her, she says, I can't wait to get out of this toxic family. I hate my dad, I hate my mum. And then she runs off with the first guy who takes her, I want to run away, take me away, thinking he's, his, he's her Janna. He ain't your Janna, darling. And then she has toxic relationship there. No, 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 run to Allah first so Allah's mother can help you. If all, and I, I, I know I just picked on our sisters, I'll pick on the brothers as well. A brother goes through problems and then he wants someone to mummy him. He's got problems with his mum. So he goes on the internet, tries to shop around for the easiest target. How old are you? Oh, are you 17? Sweet, sweet. Because 17 is like, good, that's, that's, that's good enough. You see a 14-year-old, how old are you? I'm 14. Oh, sweet, sweet. What are they after? They go to their mates and they say, look, look, I picked her up. Oh, man, bro, you're, you're, you're a champion. Show us how to do it. These people have got problems and we need to nurture them. We need to nurture them. No, brother and sister, don't go after that in order for you to try and fulfill that little gap that you might have. No, that's going to lead you astray. But anyway, after all these three stages, if nothing works and the reminders come again and again, then the, catas the catastrophe happens. And I'm going to finish it with this. Do you know what the catastrophe is? What do you think it is? Huh? What do you think the catastrophe is? If all the reminders come to the person and the person does not wake up and return, what is the catastrophe that Allah brings you? You might think death, sickness, Allah's going to send a lightning bolt, a lightning uh, on you, someone's going to murder you, someone's going to go from your family, something terrible is going to happen, you're going to lose your business. No, 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 no. None of that is going to be the catastrophe. You'll be surprised to know that the final catastrophe will be Allah just lets you go. He just lets you go. Do whatever you want. Make as much money as you want. Fulfill your every piece of desire that you ever wanted. So Allah lets you go to the dunya, to your desires, to everything. We do not want to reach that stage because that means that Allah is no longer with us. He has abandoned us because we abandoned him. And the only thing we will receive is a temporary ugly world and even the world will turn against you. As for the hereafter, there will be nothing left. And that's why Allah says, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ أُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ And do not be like those who forgot Allah. So Allah made them forget who they are. These are truly the ones who are corrupt. But rather... We want to be among those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and we love him. And inshallah, we get the best of both worlds here and in the hereafter, inshallah. Say ameen. Jazakumullahu khair. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahu.